Why does language and why do words matter when we are dying? A few years ago, many years ago actually, I first set foot in a hospice. I was a junior doctor then, and I went there on a taster career day to find out what palliative care was all about. I'd never experienced palliative care, but I'd heard many good things. And so I didn't know what to expect when I went into the hospice. In fact, I felt a bit nervous. I felt a sense of trepidation when I stepped in there. What was this place going to be like? Was it going to be very solemn? Was it going to be very quiet, respectful? Well, nothing could have been further from the truth, because when I stepped through the doors and went inside to the main downstairs ward, there was quite raucous laughter. Uh, there were patients standing around talking to the nursing staff and the junior doctors. And in the center was, was one, clearly a patient, who uh, was handing over a bouquet of flowers to uh, one of the members of nursing staff. And uh, he was sharing some experiences from the last few weeks uh, in which he had been an inpatient here. And he was saying goodbye. He was going back home. And uh, everyone was very relaxed. Uh, they were drinking cups of coffee and sharing biscuits. And um, it, it crushed a few of my cliches. I thought, well, hospice is probably the place where people come and they stay there and they don't really leave again. But he was going home after having had his symptom uh, controlled looked to. He'd gone there with a lot of pain and now his pain was much better and his symptoms were better controlled. And he'd clearly built a really good rapport with the nurses and the doctors there because he gave um, one of the junior doctors a, a big hug before he left. So that day I spent time with volunteers, aromatherapists, hypnotherapists, um, nurses, junior doctors, all had idiosyncratic roles in the management of people who were facing the end of their life. And I thought this was wonderful. Um, and then to top it all off, at about 4.30 that day, one of the healthcare assistants, she, she rolled out a trolley laden with alcohol, loads of alcohol in it, gin, whiskey, beer, you name it. And I said, oh, this looks good. What, what's happening here? And one of the junior doctors explained, well, uh, often in, in cancer and in some terminal illnesses, it really robs you of your appetite. It's called anorexia. And uh, alcohol is a nice little appetite increaser. It, it gives you a bit more of an appetite. So this is essentially a pre-dinner drink. <laughs> so after a gin and tonic, my own career choice was made. I was going to go into palliative care. And a few months later, I went to the same hospice for a, a job interview as a junior doctor, and I, I got the job, and, and the rest is history. Well, this falls down. Um, so palliative care, the word palliative means to, to protect, to protect from ill, to cloak from ill. And I, I wanted to talk to you really about some of the lessons I've learned over the years. I'm now a consultant in palliative care. But the people who've taught me the most powerful lessons, really, have been patients over the years. And I really treasure this little diary. It's um, something um, I usually keep fairly private, so this feels like a very open space to share it with all of the world. But I've, I've selected four quotes from, from patients, which um, I found very meaningful. I want to talk through them today. And I think you will find them, them interesting. So first quote less of the militaristic battle language in cancer, please. This came from a lady. Um, she was in the cancer center. I was seeing her with my registrar doctor and one of the palliative care nurses. She, she felt let down. Uh, she'd used phraseology throughout her illness, like, I will fight this. I will wage war on these cancer cells. I will annihilate the cancer in my body. Uh, I will uh, uh, bravely go through chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I will, I will, I will suffer the, the hair loss and the nausea and the vomiting, um, but I, I will fight my way through. And she used this terminology, and doctors and nurses used this terminology with her as well. Um, and she used this with her family as well, and her family, vice versa, were using the same quite violent militaristic terminology in trying to annihilate this cancer, trying to destroy it. So what's wrong with that, might, might you think? I think initially it was probably quite enabling for her. It was quite a, a good way to, to, to approach this, perhaps. But now, 
when she had been told that her cancer had spread um, throughout her body, she felt let down. She felt like a loser in this war. And she, she felt like she'd let her family down when this fighting tall carpet had essentially been pulled underneath her feet. And so she, she felt that had she approached it differently from the start, had she used other language that perhaps allowed for the worst moments or the difficult moments, uh, she might have been standing or feeling very different about the news that she had just received. Uh, a famous uh, doctor, Dr. Kate Granger, died last year. Uh, she was a big writer and a big campaigner uh, on end-of-life care issues. And she said, if anyone, if anyone says about me after I've died that Kate lost her brave battle with cancer, I will come back and I will haunt them. <laughs> she didn't want to be remembered as a loser. She had contributed so much to palliative and end-of-life care and to medicine in general. She didn't want to be remembered as a loser. She wanted to be remembered as a winner, and that she is. So what language could we use? Well, I've thought of some sentences and I've selected some that patients, again, have given me over the years. And in fact, they use the language of peace and the language of love. I hope I'm restful and calm when I get more unwell. I'd like to think about chemo carefully, consider the pros and cons, and come to terms with the future. I want to write lots of thank you letters to the people I love. As long as my family and friends are around me, perhaps doting on me and making some ice cold drinks, then I will be happy. Quote number two. Less of this compulsory positivity, please. I'm allowed a bit of negativity and pessimism. Now, you might find this one a bit strange because surely positivity is, is, is a good thing in cancer settings. The positivity movement is said to have started with a pastor called Norman Vincent Peale in the 50s. He, he wrote, wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. He was actually Donald Trump's mentor, whatever, whatever you think about that. Um, but it sold millions of copies, and it spurned this big positivity movement with its, its, its books, its DVDs, its self-help seminars, and probably a fair smattering of TED Talks as well. Um, but it, it, it has, and so this lady felt as well, really um, come into the healthcare setting as well. And it came into the healthcare setting with quite a vengeance when I noticed that some of my patients had, had read a book called The Secret. Uh, the Secret talks about the power of positivity and, and the law of attraction. So if you remain positive at all times, uh, you will invite positivity into your body. If you are negative, if you're a glass half empty person, you will invite negative in it, energy into your body and create cancer uh, and other conditions. In fact, if you have cancer uh, and you are negative, it'll make your cancer worse. And, and many of my patients believe this, but then they are terribly disappointed when, despite all their positivity, and this mask, as they sometimes in retrospect have described it, um, has let them down. And it isn't natural, is it? If, if something bad happens, it's quite normal to feel negative and to feel bad about it. It's normal to be sad or fearful. And in those moments, it is particularly important that we share those fears with those who are close to us. I've seen many families who've stifled those conversations and said to a patient, no, no, please, please don't talk about this, this negative aspect. Let's be positive. Let's just focus on the positive. Well, that isn't always what life is about. And if you can talk about your fears, then you can express what your darkest fears are and perhaps you feel better afterwards because those around you know what you don't want. Which leads us on to quote number three. When I expressed 
how I would like to spend my last weeks and the treatments I'd find acceptable and not acceptable, I actually felt a sense of relief. Now for this one, I would quite like you to engage a little thought experiment. Could you all close your eyes, please? Now, I can only check on the front rows here because the light is uh, disrupting me a bit, so I won't know if you're not really closing your eyes, but close your eyes, please. And I want you to imagine your own dying moments. Where are you? Who's with you? What setting are you in? What can you hear? Okay, open your eyes again, please. Hands up those who were in a clinical setting, in a, in a hospital setting. Yeah, there's a few of you there. And hands up those who were perhaps at home. Yeah, there are a few of you there as well. Hands up those who couldn't quite picture the scene. Yeah, <laughs> a few of those as well. This is quite, quite normal. I, I, I use this little thought experiment with, with, with students a lot of the time. Um, my favorite one is when one student once said to me he was on a beach with a pina colada next to him. <laughs> that has to be my all-time favorite. Um, but really, now imagine uh, conducting this little thought experiment, which might have come easy to you, might have been difficult, but now imagine conducting this little thought experiment around Sunday lunch with your family. It would probably not go down very well. <laughs> Someone would say, hang on a moment, let's not talk about this. This is a horrible thing to talk about. Yet, we feel it is a very important thing to talk about, especially if you have a palliative life limiting illnesses. What are your wishes? Where would you want to be? How would you want it to look like? What is plan A and perhaps plan B if things don't go so well? If those who love you don't know, then they won't know if you become less able to communicate. So expressing this difficult topic and talking about it with those who you are closest to it becomes very important. It's strange because I'm often a stranger in, uh, to a person who has just met me, but people find it easy to talk to me about it, perhaps because I'm a stranger, but they found, find it incredibly difficult to talk to their own friends and, and family about this very topic. So this really is just a, a plea to, to, to think about these areas. And um, I also work for a, a charity called Dying Matters in Wales. It's uh, called Bu Now, which is Welsh for live now. I said that in a nice Welsh-German accent. I hope you appreciated it. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. Um, and we've created some resources to help people think about the treatments that they would consider, perhaps, but also the treatments that they wouldn't want when they become more unwell and less able to communicate. Uh, one of those treatments, or there's many treatments, uh, you might find it perfectly acceptable to have an intravenous drip or intravenous antibiotics or perhaps even a blood transfusion and go to hospital for that when you're more unwell. But when you hear about cardiopulmonary resuscitation and what it can do to your body and how unsuccessful it is in palliative illness, you might think twice. You might say, well, I'm happy for doctors to consider it, but, or you might say, well, actually, no, this is not something I would particularly want. Now, it's a very complex topic, and we've tried to make this a little bit easier. So with the charity, we created some videos, and with patients, and with volunteers, and with the NHS as well, we've created these videos, and they're on the talkcpr.wales website. Uh, if you want to get there a bit quicker via Twitter, there's a hashtag called, called talkcpr. And so this is just one of many ways to open up difficult conversations about a topic that is often dismissed and brushed under the carpet as too dreary to talk about. Quote number four. Please, Doc, tell my family to lighten up a bit. It's not like I'm dying today. Uh, this man was very, very funny, and the nurses really liked him, which is usually a sign that he's a big troublemaker which he was. He was a real joker. Um, but he also confessed to me that he felt quite lonely. And the reason for this loneliness wasn't because he didn't have friends and family. Uh, he had many people who, were, who surrounded him. And, uh, but their approach to him changed somehow. 
when they heard that he had a terminal illness. Their language towards him changed. The language stopped. They stopped contacting him. They felt awkward. They perhaps understandably didn't have the vocabulary to, to express what they felt and perhaps their own awkwardness. But what he really wished for was for them to stay normal and just behave in the same way that they always had. Occasionally telling them to shut up as well. But he wanted them not to change. He wanted them to treat him in the same way they always had. I'll, I'll never forget him because uh, one day on a ward round, he was always telling jokes, but I, I won't forget this one. He, he called me over and said, Mark, Mark, come over. And I said, yeah, what's going on? So I've got this joke for you. You probably won't laugh, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, Doc, I've been on a once in a lifetime holiday. I tell you what, never again. <laughs> we looked at each other for a moment, and then we both started laughing. And I always remember that moment because he died several weeks later. And I feel that the language he used, the humor that he used, was so fantastic. And I have felt over the years, I've learned that in palliative care, humor, death, and dying are often quite closely intertwined. And so I'm not going to remember him for his death or his dying. I'm always going to remember him for that joke. In fact, he would love it that I've told so many of you this <laughs> joke. Um, it's really great. So I'm going to end on someone who's a greater language expert than I will ever be, and who died many centuries ago, William Shakespeare. This is from Romeo and Juliet, Act 4, Scene 5. How oft, when men are at the point of death, have they been merry, which their keepers call a lightning before death. Thank you.